hello everybody. Uh, so welcome back. This is parallel session four. We've got some thought experiments, some logic, some contextuality. So it's the place to be. Um, <laughs> and uh, first up, uh, we have Nuria Nurgalyeva, who's joining us from ETH Zurich, uh, and she's online. So I'll pass it over to you now, Nuria. Today I'm going to, to give a talk about uh, a joint work together with Simon Martis, a master student at the time, Lydia Del Dio and uh, Renata Renner. And this is basically a talk about a software package which allows you to uh, model thought experiments on a quantum computer. To access the software package, you can scan this nice uh, QR code in the corner and this will lead you to the GitHub repository with all files and all examples, which are nicely explained in Jupyter notebooks that are there. So why thought experiments? In science, we often turn to so-called thought experiments to explore the theory and its limitations. For example, such are twin paradox and special relativity or Maxwell's demon in thermodynamics. In quantum mechanics, they're used to formulate no-go theorems, uh, which can rule out certain interpretations of quantum theory. But thought experiments have not only conceptual value. The main characters of these scenarios are reasoning agents or machines who are able to draw conclusions based on their knowledge. Imagine a classical setting, a network of computers, which we want to reason about an event happening elsewhere in the framework. We want this reasoning to be consistent. Uh, we want their reasoning about their knowledge to be consistent. So that would be sure that uh, the conclusions that they draw are sound. So what do we mean by consistency? Let me illustrate it with a very simple uh, and silly logical example, which is this puzzle about three physicists who are also very logical people. Alice, Bob, and Charlie, who after a long day at work, um, decide to unwind and go to a bar to get a drink. And they're sitting down and the bartender asks them, does everybody want wine? And the following scenario ensues. Alice answers, I don't know. Bob answers, I don't know. And Charlie answers, yes. So how did Charlie uh, manage to consistently reason about Alice's and Bob's um, desires and knowledge? So first, uh, like we can take to understand his reasoning, we can take Alice's point of view. So Alice is very logical. So if she wouldn't have wanted wine, she would have answered no to this question because then not everyone in the group uh, would have wanted wine. But she answers, I don't know, which means that she actually wants wine. She just doesn't know if others uh, want that too. The same reasoning can be applied to, to Bob's answer. And then finally, Charlie wants wine as well as Alice and Bob, and he answers yes, and they all happily get their wine. So we would like this type of consistent reasoning about knowledge hold for um, any agent's reasoning in, in, a, in a given theory. However, um, this might be proved so uh, this might prove to be complicated and uh, for a network of quantum computers or quantum agents. Um, so for example, in a quantum mechanical thought experiment designed by Daniela Frau Higer and Renato Renner in 2018, uh, the agents modeled within the theory and also allowed to reason about each other's outcomes come to a contradiction. This, is, this contradiction is based on a number of assumptions which concern how agents are modeled, how they make their predictions and inferences, and how these predictions and inferences are combined. Uh, and in our work, we propose uh, the software which allows you to play around with different assumptions and different um, communication protocols between agents to, te to test the power and the range of predictions of a particular setting. So first I'll give you a more quantum reasoning example. Um, then we'll see how we model uh, measurements and reasoning uh, for quantum agents. Then I'll explain a bit about how the software package is constructed. 
And finally, we'll look at one testing example, which is implemented in the software currently, which is the Frauhinger Renner dot experiment. Okay, so let us start with quantum. Let's say first, let's uh, start with agents who are reasoning about uh, outcomes of quantum measurements. So now we are again back to uh, Alice and Bob, but now they are not ordering wine; they are measuring qubits. And Alice has a qubit R in her lab initially in in the state, um, and she measures it in a computational basis. And depending on her measurement result, she prepares other system S either in a state zero if she gets outcome zero, or in a state plus if she gets outcome one. And then she sends this, the system S to Bob. Then Alice leaves the lab uh, and Bob comes in. And everything that Bob has access to is system S, but he's really curious about Alice's measurement results. He doesn't want to bother her and ask her directly. So what he does is he measures the system S and hopes that based on his measurement outcome, he'll be able to say, something about Alice's measurement outcome. So suppose that he gets outcome one. Uh, can he say anything certain about Alice's measurement? Um, in fact, yes, because he starts thinking, reasoning that, okay, if Alice would have measured zero, then she would have prepared the system S in the state zero, and I wouldn't be able to get outcome one of my measurement. This means that Alice has gotten the outcome one. And in this case, Bob can measure, Bob can reason with certainty that Alice got outcome one in case he gets outcome one. Okay, so this is, this is the type of reasoning that we're gonna look at uh, for quantum agents. And now what we would like to do, we would like to model Alice and Bob as quantum systems as well. And to do so, we need to, model two processes as quantum processes or unitaries. Um, first, it's the measurement that agents do in this in the scenarios. And second is the reasoning process. So first, let us look at the measurement. So um, we motivate the modeling on the measurement by the oldest um, measure, quantum measurement device, which is the stern um experiment device where we measure the spin with which we measure the spin of, of a particle and the way we measure the spin of the particle we effectively couple the spin the degree of freedom of the spin uh, to another degree of freedom of the particle for example um, the y degree of freedom and we can do the same for um for when we are considering qubits so which when we are considering um, Alice as a qubit, as, as a memory qubit, and uh, her measurement is done, done on the qubit R that she has in her lab. So suppose that Alice is measuring this qubit R and we model her uh, degree of freedom as this memory qubit, which is initialized in a state zero. Then this coupling procedure analogous to, to the stern gellach experiment can be modeled as a C0, for example. This is also a good point to, um, to introduce Wigner's thought experiment, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, um, where we also have a Wigner outside Alice's lab. So from different points of view, this physical process looks differently. So for Alice, who's measuring system R inside the lab, after her measurement, the system collapses in either state zero or one. And for Wigner, we have this unitary measurement procedure uh, on both systems R and A, which results in this entangled state. And here we see that uh, this physical situation allows for this dichotomy of views, which already should give you a hint that uh, reasoning about um, each other's knowledge uh, in quantum settings might not be as straightforward as in classical settings and might not always uh, match our classical intuition about reasoning. But the, the thing that we take away from this slide is that, oh, we can model this measurements as a C-notes. 
Okay, now back to our reasoning agents example, um, where Bob is measuring system S to say something about Alice's measurement results. Uh, and now we want to model A and B as um, quantum systems as well, in particular B, and model his reasoning. So how do we do that? So what is happening with Bob? So Bob is measuring, first measuring system S that he has and writing the result to his memory qubit. So this is this second system in this circuit. Uh, then for the, for the purposes of reasoning, we introduce more qubits to Bob's uh, reasoning machine, so to say. So first we have these two qubits, which we call inference qubits, which record whether um, Bob can make any certain prediction about Alice's outcome. So the first, the first qubit corresponds to Bob getting outcome zero and then being able to say anything certain about Alice's result. We encode, uh, we, uh, we initialize this qubit in a state zero because as we've seen in a previous example, if Bob gets outcome zero, well, he cannot say anything certain about Alice's result. The second inference qubit corresponds to, to the case when Bob gets outcome one and he's able to say something uh, certain about Alice's outcome. And indeed he can, because if he gets outcome one, Alice also gets, should have gotten outcome one. So we initialize this inference qubit in a state one, uh, noting that indeed uh, there, there, it stores some, a certain prediction. And finally, we have the prediction qubit uh, where Bob stores his prediction about Alice's outcome uh, based on his own outcome. And then the reasoning process can be described as uh, two following gates, which are uh, basically doubly controlled Toffoli-like gates. So first, Bob, uh, the first gate is controlled on, on the case where Bob gets outcome zero. Uh, then we check the if the corresponding uh, inference qubit is initialized in state one. And if both of these conditions are satisfied, we update the prediction state. And the same for the case when Bob gets outcome one, then we check if, if a corresponding inference qubit is initialized in one, uh, and then we update the prediction. So this is how this reasoning circuit works. Uh, we don't claim that this is a minimal or most effective solution. You're very welcome to propose your own, uh, but this is just an example of how one can make this work. Okay, so now let me explain how the software package is structured. So the software package has several modules. So one of the modules is the logics module, which governs um, how the predictions of agents are combined and which predictions are allowed to be made. And uh, if, for example, some paradoxes are generally allowed in the framework, um, like in paraconsistent approach, where we just take some paradoxes um, as, as given, so saying that they just exist. Then we have an agents module um, where we specify how we model agents, their memories, their reasoning process, uh, measurements, and so on. And we have an interpretation module, which basically governs the way how agents make predictions about each other's outcomes. Um, and finally, we have the protocol where we specify the, um, the steps that agents need to make and um, which systems they have to measure and which systems they have to reason about. And then combining all these um, four things, we can run the software and reach a conclusion, which is, um, which is whether the setting is consistent or not. Okay, so we have several examples implemented in, um, in, our, in our software, uh, which, are, which are also available on GitHub. Some of them are just sanity checks for your logic or uh, your agent implementations. Uh, but we also implement one, uh, 
one setting I already talked about, which is the Frau Hugerwena setting, where agents come to, under certain assumptions, agents come to a contradiction. Now, let me just quickly recap that. So, fortunately, we already um, seen part of this setting because we already considered Alice and Bob in their labs and Bob reasoning about Alice's outcome. So this will be fairly easy to explain. So again, we have Alice, um, who we model as a memory qubit, uh, zero, where she writes her initialized in zero, where she writes down the result of her measurement. And she has the system R initially in this state, which she measures on computational basis and writes down the result to her memory. Then she prepares the system S based on her, based on her outcome in zero or plus. And this is the intermediate state of the systems R, A, and S. And then she sends the system S to Bob's lab. And Bob also measures it in a computational basis and writes down the result to his memory. So this is the joint state of Alice's and Bob's labs. OK, and now we have two more agents who are looking at Alice's and Bob's labs from the outside. These are Orzola and Wigner, and they measure Alice's and Bob's labs respectively in OK fail basis, which are basically this bell basis. And applying the same type of argument that we did for when we were talking about Bob reasoning about Alice, we can see that uh, Orzo can come to a conclusion that if she gets outcome OK, then Bob gets outcome 1. Uh, if, then if, if Bob gets outcome 1, um, then Alice gets outcome 1. And Alice can reason that if she gets outcome 1, Wigner gets outcome fail. And finally, Wigner just makes a statement about post-selection. So he says that, oh, we only consider the rounds where both me and Urzola get, get outcome OK. And so we have these four statements. And you see that if we combine the statements in the correct order, uh, we, we arrive to a paradox. So if we start with this cloud here, we can start with Ursula getting outcome OK, then Bob gets outcome 1, then Alice gets outcome 1, then Wigner gets outcome fail. But it contradicts this initial um, consideration of only the rounds where both Ursula and Wigner get outcome OK. And we come to a paradox. And basically, whether you get this paradox or not depends on what exactly are the assumptions that you input in your, in your system. And that's how you can test different assumptions about logic and or your favorite axiom system, your favorite model for an agent, um, your preferred interpretation. So currently we have implemented two, which are neo Copenhagen uh, and collapse theories, but we're, uh, we're very, we, we invite uh, all representatives of all uh, interpretations to implement your favorite interpretation and um, test it on our software. And then you can also input not only FR, but any desired communication protocol and the software will tell you whether it's consistent or not, whether your guess for the um, set of the assumptions is consistent or not. Okay, so this is, again, the link to the GitHub repository. I'll be very happy to answer any questions about it. You can just email me um, directly. And we are also looking forward to um, to any contributions that you would like to make to uh, make this testing system even better. And thank you for your attention. Okay, so quick change. And now we can uh, welcome Marwan Hadara, who is from Griffith University, uh, telling us about some uh, more thought experiments. Yes. So, okay, first of all, uh, thank you to all the organizers. It's like a real pleasure and privilege to be able to attend this conference in person and of course thanks to everyone back in Australia for making it possible. So today I'm going to present to you some of our recent work 
which is directly related to this local friendliness no-go theorem, which was published a few years ago. It considers this type of extended weakness fence scenario illustrated on the left, where there's a source sending systems to two observers, Charlie and Debbie. Uh, Charlie and Debbie make some measurement and record outcomes C and D. Uh, then there's Alice and Bob. Uh, from their perspective, Charlie and Debbie are like any other physical systems, but we assume that they are technologically very capable. So Alice and Bob can implement any uh, operation on Charlie and Debbie they wish. Uh, their measurements are labeled by X and Y and outcomes A and B. And for now, the only kind of commitment we make is that x equal 1 and y equal 1 have a special role, which corresponds to the case where Alice reads the outcome of Charlie and Bob reads the outcome of Debbie. So on the right, there is the space-time diagram for this experiment. And I'm going to use the convention where the capital letters uh, just denote the variables and these lowercase letters are like an arbitrary instance, uh, like a fixed value of that variable. So here is local friendliness. It's the conjunction of these two principles. Absoluteness of observed events is kind of self-explaining. Then local agency, which says that an intervention is uncorrelated with any set of relevant physical events outside the future light cone of the intervention. So it's like a operationally motivated uh, no action at the distance principle. Uh, these translate to kind of constraints uh, which, well, conditions that constrain the behavior that the super observers, so what Alice and Bob can see in this experiment. And I'll just summarize it very briefly like this. So if we consider ordinary Bell scenarios, so that's a case where there is no Charlie and Debbie, then the only constraint is no signaling. Uh, but it becomes very interesting in these extended weakness fence scenarios because there the uh, observations by the friends are like hidden variables for those special measurements. Uh, and these constraints are shown to define a polytope, so finite set of inequalities. But in general, those inequalities are less constraining than the Bell inequalities. So, uh, yeah, the assumptions are quite weak and the fact that quantum behavior in these scenarios can violate those inequalities proves like a really interesting no-go theorem. So, Here's our present result. is basically a probability-free formulation of that no-go theorem. So basically like what the GH and the Hardy theorems are to Bell's theorem, this result will be like that. Uh, we do this by replacing every reference to probabilities with possibilities. And uh, possibility, necessity and those type of things are actually like the topic of this branch of moral logic, which is known as athletic moral logic. So in our work, we kind of treat it, treat it like, uh, like that. But what I'm going to do today is just to show you like a kind of informal argument that does not require knowledge of that. So here we go. Uh, first principle is same as before, absoluteness of the event. Uh, second one, we replace local agency with possibilistic local agency which says that if a set of events is possible, then for any intervention, which is not in the past light cone of any of those events, then the set, set of events is possible in conjunction with any value for Z. Uh, maybe it sounds a little bit contrived, but the intuition is still the same. So local agency said that intervention is uncorrelated with events outside the future light cone. Well, if an event is outside the future, then the intervention is not in its past. So it's like saying that whatever is possible outside the future doesn't care about that intervention. Uh, next, this little detail, when we talk about possibility or impossibility, it can be a very deep philosophical issue potentially. So we are, of course, like considering a very narrow experimental context where it makes sense to say that some things happen and some things don't. And in particular, if we have a probabilistic theory, we can translate the probabilities into possibilities by this possibilistic collapse. 
So if E given Z is uh, probability for that is greater than zero, then we can say that E in conjunction with Z is possible. So that diamond is modal logical notation for possibility. So whenever you see diamond, it means possible. Now, it should be clear that if uh, probabilities satisfy local agency, then the possibilities implied by this possibilistic collapse will satisfy possibilistic local agency. But in general, the converse does not have to be true. So actually, possibilistic local agency is even a little bit weaker condition than local agency. Uh, now we fix the scenario. A, B, C, and D can take values in the set 0, 1, X, and Y, uh, 1 and 2. And we fix this possibilistic phenomenon, or part of it. Uh, first line says that A equals 1, B equals 1, X equals 2, Y equals 2 is possible. Second line will say A equals 0, B equal 1, X equal 1, Y equal 2 is not possible, and so on. Uh, the other unspecified events, we can just say they're possible, they don't really play a role in this. So now, okay, first line. I uh, put these events into the space-time diagram, so this can happen by the first line. Absoluteness of observed events implies that it should be possible in conjunction with some values of C and D, maybe more than one possibility, but at least for some. Now we can use possibilistic local agency because X is not in the past light cone of any of the green events. We can change x to 1, and this set of events should be possible, at least for some a. But we had the special measurement for x equals 1, so now a should equal c. And now when we look at the second line of the phenomenon, which said that that's not possible, we can conclude that this little c cannot be 0. So whatever c and d are, they can't be 0. Now we can repeat that argument by changing y instead of x to get that d can be 0. And finally, changing both x and y to 1, conclude that c and d can both be 1. And that's basically the contradiction, because we exhausted all the possible values for c and d, so they're not consistent with this phenomenon, assuming this AOE and PLA. Uh, just to put the cherry on top of cake, so to say, we can reproduce this phenomenon uh, in quantum realization of an extended weakness scenario, assuming uh, that uni uh, unitary quantum mechanics is un universal, world. so here's just an example of that. Uh, these are basically the same correlations that leads to Har Hardy's paradox, but Maybe it's good to emphasize that under our assumptions, there is no issue in an ordinary Bell scenario, so it happens in the extended weakness case. Now, I don't have time to go through this modal logical stuff, but just to give you an idea if there is someone in the audience who wants to discuss this, uh, we basically use the Kripke semantics of modal logic and translate all these assumptions into this language of modal logic, and we ask if there is any such model where even in a single world our assumptions will be true. And basically, following the line of reasoning I just showed you, we can see that these assumptions don't fit into the struct structure at all, so they're just contradictory. So, here are some uh, words about the implications. Uh, in particular, from the lens of this modal logical approach we use, uh, something has to go clearly if we want to have that type of behavior in those type of scenarios. So reject possibilistic local agency. Well, that's quite straightforward. But if we try to use this modal logic and reject absoluteness of sort events while keeping possibilistic local agency, then that's not clear at all. And we think maybe it means that modal logic it itself should maybe be modified somehow to make sense of that alternative. And here I'd like to mention also this uh, work from a few years ago by Nurgaleva and Del Rio. Nurgaleva just tried to give a speech uh, where they cast this 
Frage Renner, no got here, I mean, this epistemic moral logic. Uh, there are some similarities in this Frage Renner and this scenario I showed you both have like multiple agents and so on, but the assumptions there are very different and uh, yeah, deal with agents reasoning about others, so it's more about knowledge, but any, in any way, it's quite interesting that this maybe brings uh, local friendliness a little bit closer to that. No go theorem by Fraugen and Renner. So, just to summarize what happened, this basically strengthens the original local friendliness no go theorem. Uh, firstly, because possibilistic local agency is actually weaker than local agency, uh, but second, because we can't really blame probability theory for that no go theorem. Actually, this critique on use of probability theory in the original. Uh, local friendliness is basically what motivated this work. Uh, there is this diagram on the right showing this uh, relationship between these assumptions and hopefully it should be clear that violation of possibilistic local friendliness implies violation of local friendliness, bell locality and this possibilistic bell locality, which is basically this hardy type stuff. So yeah, that's I guess more or less all I want to say. Okay, thanks, uh, Marwan. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, so, maybe while you're thinking, uh, I can just ask you. So, you kind of formulated this in a theory independent way now, you're saying. So, then can you consider like how uh, other GPTs, like for example, would fare in this situation, like whether they also uh, satisfy your no-go theorem, or does this not make sense as a thing to think about? Uh, so, if I understand correctly, if I go back, so here, yeah, so the issue here is, oh wow, that went out of control. Well, anyway, the point is that any theory that allows that type of behavior in an extended weakness when scenario like the one described, it will have this issue. So quantum theory is an example of such a theory. And yeah, something has to go, but maybe. Uh, GPT is compatible with quantum predictions in general will have this issue. Right. Yeah, well, okay, we can even make like bell local models. Mm -hmm. uh, they will not uh, mm -hmm. describe nature well, but <laughs> yes. will satisfy these uh, assumptions quite well. So, okay, okay, thanks. Question Is this working? Yes. Thanks for the talk. So, I'd like to ask something you mentioned. So, in what sense the possibilistic uh, local Friendliness is it? You say it's weaker, if I understood correctly, than the the other case, right? So, could you please explain or expand more on this topic? Ah, yes. So, I meant weaker. The assumptions are weaker. The implications are stronger. Yes. We rule out weaker assumptions with the no go theorem. Thanks for the nice talk. So this uh, now this option of giving up possibilistic local agency um, would it sort of conflict with relativistic causality basically because this, uh, so and and in, and in what sense would it allow us to signal outside the light cone or is it more of something that would allow you to causally influence things outside the light cone in a theory that gives up this possibilistic local agency? Yeah, so it can happen in two ways. The other is the more radical one where actually the super observers can like see signals. That's a radical one. The other one is the kind of more hidden, hidden one, which is like in the Bohmian case. So Bohmian mechanics would not satisfy local agency or possibilistic local agency because they're, well, yeah, so <laughs> that, that's how it is. <laughs> and if I may just make a comment about your very nice question before. Uh, so for the case of GPTs, like in, in a work by uh, myself and Nuria, we kind of extended uh, the frauke garena type experiment to like PR boxes and so on. But it would, I haven't thought about how it fits with your no-go theorem. This would be very interesting to think about how that 
fits with what you know going through yourself. So yeah, thanks for the interesting talk. Thanks. Okay, uh, so maybe to stay on time, well, not on time, but slightly less behind time, uh, we can thank Marwan again. Uh, uh, so now I have the pleasure of welcoming uh, Masanao uh, Azawa, uh, who is from Nagoya, um, and he's going to tell us about some contextual hidden variable theories. Okay. Okay, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for holding this uh, very nice uh, conference. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, logical characterization of uh, contextual hidden variable theories uh, based on quantum set theory. Uh, uh, to make uh, quantum logic great again, <laughs> Uh, we construct mathematics based on uh, quantum logic. According to Bulwaki, we have only to uh, construct a third theory instead of constructing various branches of mathematics. Uh, for this purpose, a Japanese logician, Kaisi Takeuchi, introduced quantum set theory in 1981. Uh, Takeuchi showed that observables uh, A of the quantum system bijectively uh, correspond to the internal real numbers A tilde in quantum set theory. Uh, internal real number means that quantum set theory has the same formula of the, our ordinary mathematics. So uh, we have the same formula to define uh, real numbers as a uh, dedicated cut of rational numbers. Then uh, we, if you uh, construct uh, quantum logical universe of set theory. In this universe, the <coughs> formula for defining uh, the real number system uh, is interpreted as the uh, self agent operators or uh, quantum observables. So the quantum observables are in this uh, universe or uh, in this uh, mathematical world. Uh, just uh, described by as uh, real numbers. Very much simplified. It's good. And so we generalized Takeuchi's quantum set theory for arbitrary von Neumann algebras. Takeuchi's quantum set theory is based on whole uh, full operator algebras. Uh, we now consider the uh, subsystems of those uh, quantum logics and uh, we construct uh, for each sub-logic for uh, the mathematical universe based on this uh, logic. And use them to characterize uh, contextual hidden variable theories. Uh, quantum set theory starts with uh, a symbol L, Y, the language of a set theory without any constant symbols, and by L, Y, U, the language of set theory augmented by constants denoting elements of U. Uh, to any von Neumann algebra M with the projection lattice PM, uh, we construct a set theoretical universe BM such that one. For any statement, uh, statement means the closed formula, uh, phi U1 to UN uh, in this uh, set theoretical language, constant, uh, including constant denoting this universe, uh, the projection value of the truth value is assigned. So for every formula, projection value uh, truth value is assigned. Also, uh, this uh, universe uh, includes the original two valued universe uh, by this embedding uh, for every e standard set to uh, this uh, uh, quantum set, a hat, a check, such that uh, a is a, a member of B, if and only if uh, a check is its member of B has a value, truth value one. Uh, a equal to B, if and only if there are a check is equal to B check has uh, truth value one in this quantum logical interpretation. Uh, for every uh, formula, 
in ordinary uh, set theory with uh, uh, ordinary set A1 to An uh, holds if and only if the corresponding formula has the abstruse value 1. And the Takeuchi correspondence uh, that the self agent operators affiliated with them. Uh, affiliated means that it's just the uh, unbounded operator with uh, uh, spectral projection in M. <laughs> uh, so, self agent operator A affiliated with M bijectively correspond to the internal real numbers A tilde in this uh, quantum universe, satisfying the <coughs> truth value of A tilde is less than or equal to. Uh, <coughs> standard uh, real number lambda uh, is equal to uh, this uh, uh, spectral projection. This is projection by the truth value. And transfer principle that for any delta zero formula, delta zero formula means that the formula with only the bounded uh, quantifier. Um, bounded quantifiers means all A in B or there exists A in B. Uh, for any delta zero formula, uh, phi pro provable in the GFC set theory and for any uh, constant uh, denoting the member of this new uh, quantum universe, then uh, this uh, statement has a truth value larger than uh, the, this uh, uh, pr projection. This is projection valued commutator. Uh, it's difficult to uh, explain this uh, in short time. Uh, and then uh, uh, for normal algebra, M is a variant if and only if the uh, truth value, uh, quantum mechanical truth value of the formula provable in GFC set theory is always one. If M is a variant. If, uh, if A is not a variant, uh, we should use this formula. So this is not a necessary one, but uh, uh, truth value is something uh, larger than commutativity of those constant symbols. <laughs> now we consider the uh, different topics about the uh, uh, contextual hidden variable theory. And the uh, algebraic characterization of this uh, uh, <coughs> contextual hidden variable theory, uh, <coughs> this starts with the Bohr's notion of elements of physical reality suggested in the Bohr EPR debate. So Bohr's uh, notion of element of physical reality has the following three uh, features. One is classicality. They should be uh, physical reality, elements of physical reality should be described by a classical language obeying classical logic. And if A is measured, uh, then uh, there is some uh, special uh, measuring uh, arrangement attached to, to the uh, observed system. In that uh, situation, if A is measured, uh, observable A is an element of reality. And also, the BOA uh, accept the contextualized version of the EPR reality criterion. Uh, if the value of B is inferred with probability unity, by the result of uh, A measurement without disturbing the value of B. <clears throat> uh, if you consider the uh, projective measurement of A, <clears throat> then <clears throat> in the case A and B are commuting, in that case, uh, B is also an element of reality. So uh, A and B are, are commuting, and uh, A, A value and B value are. Uh, 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 completely, uh, perfectly correlated. Uh, in that case, the B is also an element of reality because the <coughs> value of B is uh, predicted without disturbing uh, <coughs> system. But uh, Bohr's case is contextualized. It means that uh, what is a real <coughs> element of reality depends on what is measured. <coughs> this is different from EPR. Now we give the following definition. Given the measurement context psi and A, it means that the situation in which uh, observable A is measured in a state psi, uh, consisting of a state vector psi and observable A, 
An observable considered to have its value is called a behavior in psi. <coughs> so we want to characterize the uh, maximum set of behaviors <coughs> related to this uh, measurement context. And this is done by Harbison and Crifton in 1999. <coughs> Uh, Harbors and Clifton maximally characterize the behaviors in measurement context uh, Psi A as observables affiliated with the following phonemic algebra M. Uh, called, this phonemic algebra is called a maximal behavior sub algebra of, uh, L of H defined, uh, definable by measurement context Psi A. And the first condition is that uh, <coughs> M is a uh, behavior in psi, in, in the sense that uh, we define this terminology from in the following. There exists a probability measure mu on the space dm of dispersion-free states of M, uh, such that the quantum mechanical expectation value uh, can be calculated by <coughs> expectation of this uh, probability measure. So uh, this is uh, usually say that the uh, quantum probability uh, defined by state of psi has uh, uh, ignorance uh, interpretation because the uh, uh, uncertainty is uh, completely uh, described by ignorance uh, expectation. And uh, A is affiliated with uh, M because uh, uh, A is measured uh, in this uh, context. In this case, the A, a is uh, considered to be a behavior, so uh, affiliated with behavior uh, for the algebra. And the definability is that <coughs> this for the algebra uh, defining the uh, behavior is uh, implicitly definable by measurement context in the sense that uh, for every unitary operator u, such that uh, psi is u invariant and a is also u invariant. In that case, for such a u, uh, m is uh, stable and uh, there is uh, automorphism. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the last, uh, last characterization is that m is maximal uh, along all for normal algebra m, satisfying all those uh, Property. So, uh, in that case, we call that this phonemic algebra uh, M is a maximal uh, behavior subalgebra definable by given contextual, uh, given uh, measurement context. Then, uh, Harbison and Clifton uh, proved the following theorem: for any measurement context. There uniquely exists a maximal behavior subalgebra definable in um, psi a. That, that means uh, for every given uh, measurement context, there is a unique phonem algebra satisfying uh, all these con conditions. And so there are uh, self agent operators uh, affiliated with uh, this maximal behavior subalgebra, it's considered to be the uh, whole set of the elements of reality uh, defined by okay, <laughs> this uh, measurement context. Uh, now we consider the uh, logical characterization of this be able uh, algebra and be able uh, logic. The language, is, this is called ZFC satisfiable in a state of psi. Uh, if uh, any formula probably in ZFC theory holds with probability unity, uh, this one, right? Uh, this is projection value, uh, truth value, uh, and this is expectation of this truth value uh, of this state should be one. In that case, uh, we say that th this language is uh, uh, ZFC uh, satisfiable. The language is called maximal ZFC satisfiable theory definable by a measurement context psi if it satisfies uh, uh, 
one, ZFC satisfiability, that is, and this language is ZFC satisfiable in this uh, state. And also, A is an internal real number in this uh, language. And the definability is uh, similar. Um, for any unit operator which is uh, invariant under U and uh, U does not uh, change A, uh, for such unit operators, uh, we define the automorphism of the uh, quantum logical universe, and then uh, this universe is stable under this uh, automorphism. And then the maximality is very uh, analogous. The, this language is maximal among all languages satisfying all these conditions. Uh, now uh, we have this following theorem. Uh, the language L V A M is ZFC satisfiable in Psi if and only if uh, phoneme algebra M is uh, behavior. Means that uh, state Psi has uh, ignorance interpretation for every element of this phoneme algebra. And the second theorem is that for any measurement context A Psi, there uniquely exists a maximal ZFC satisfiable theory L. Uh, Ypsilon uh, BM, uh, definable by uh, measurement context. Uh, and in this case, uh, M is a maximal behavioral subalgebra definable by uh, Psi A. And the last theorem said that if uh, A tilde is equal B tilde, uh, A and B are two uh, observables, and in this uh, language, uh, if uh, corresponding uh, internal real numbers A tilde and corresponding uh, internal real numbers B tilde are equal with probability one in this state psi. That means uh, the truth value has expectation one in this state. Then B is in the maximal ZFC satisfiable theory definable by the measurement context psi A. So. Uh, Psi eight. Okay. <laughs> and the last last slide. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, the example of that. Consider the EPR pair, uh two cubic, and then uh state is a singlet state and observable is uh sigma z tensor i. <laughs> So uh, in this uh, uh, measurement context, so measuring uh, sigma z tensor identity in state, singlet state. So in this uh, measurement context, uh, we, we have unique, the maximal behavior subalgebra definable by this uh, measurement context. <laughs> then <coughs> let B is identity tensor sigma z, which is uh, opposite uh, tensor. Then, uh, according to the singlet state, uh, this is minus sign. Uh, then uh, those two are perfectly correlated. So, uh, identity tensor sigma z is uh, element of the reality, but uh, identity tensor uh, cosine theta sigma z plus sine theta sigma x uh, is not the, uh, not in the, this. Uh, Maximal uh, behavior subalgebra, or uh, uh, this is not the element of reality. Conclusion is that we conclude that for any measurement context psi a, there uniquely exists a maximal contextual hidden variable theory. That is, the maximal ZFC satisfiable theory definable by the measurement context a psi, which maximally realizes both notion of elements of physical reality. Thank you. Well, okay, questions? We're at the back. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I know there have been some work maybe 10 years ago about uh, some uh, topos theoretic approach uh -huh. to logic. And 
for me it has a similar vibe of uh, using these bore ideas. So would you know of which topos your theory will be the internal language? language? Uh, the, they consider the uh, bore verification uh, as a uh, reconstruct uh, whole uh, quantum theory from the uh, order uh, structure of the uh, Abelian phonema subalgebras. And they consider the Abelian phonema subalgebras as a con context. Uh, now we have uh, a different approach because their context is uh, defined as a state independent way because the uh, Abelian phonema algebra is Abelian for in any state. However, uh, we consider only the uh, state dependent Abelian phonema algebra because uh, we, our characterization of be able uh, phonema algebra in state of psi uh, is just the uh, state dependent Abelian phonema algebra. That's different. And uh, state dependency is very important, uh, I, I think. Uh, considering the contextuality uh, or con hidden contextual hidden variable theory because uh, if you consider the uh, Bohr EPR debate, um, so the criterion for the uh, reality is just the uh, state dependent. Um, there are observable A here, observable B here, and there is an entangled state. Uh, if the uh, measurement of A Result um, perfectly correlated to value of B. In that case, uh, measurement A guarantees that uh, reality of B. So this uh, criterion completely depends on the state in which uh, the A is measured. So the, what is uh, reality and uh, what is physical reality in those, that case uh, entirely? depend on the uh, notion of state. So uh, I, I think uh, this approach is more uh, stronger <laughs> than Topos approach. Okay. Hello, okay. Uh, so we're running a little bit behind, so maybe any more questions can be addressed after the session. So maybe we can thank Masa now again. Thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Hello, QPL, and thank you very much for tuning into my talk about natural deduction and quantum logic. First, I want to talk a little bit about classical logic, just to set the stage. In classical logic, propositions, of course, form a Boolean lattice. For us, a post set with a node reversing involution, satisfying some axioms. And in any Boolean lattice, we can define an implication connective. P implies Q by not P or Q. And this implication connective satisfies an adjunction. P and Q is less than or equal to R if and only if p is less than or equal to q implies r. And this adjunction suggests or motivates the standard interpretation of sequence. A sequent p1 through pn entails q is interpreted as p1 and p2 and so forth to pn is less than or equal to q. In orthomodular logic, the story is very similar. There, by definition, propositions form an orthomodular lattice. And in any orthomodular lattice, we can define two connectives. P implies Q by not P or P and Q. And P and then Q by P or not Q and Q. And these are, of course, the familiar Sasaki implication and Sasaki projection. And together, these two connectives satisfy a familiar, uh, well, let's say, a similar adjunction to the one that we saw on the previous slide. P and then Q is less than or equal to R, if and only if P is less than or equal to Q implies R. And just as in classical logic, this adjunction suggests a particular interpretation for sequence. P1 through Pn entails Q, is then interpreted as P1 and then P2, and so forth the Pn is less than or equal to Q. The Sasaki projection is not an associative connective, so uh, we adopt the convention that it associates to the left. And uh, the reason for adopting this specific convention is it will make the rules for implication that we have sound. But before we look at the rules for orthomodular logic, let's first look at a sequent calculus 
for classical logic. This isn't any of the canonical sequent calculi for classical logic, but it's fairly close to all of them. At the top, we have three structural rules, namely the assumption rule and the cut rule, and a special case of the weakening rule. Then we have three familiar rules for conjunction, two familiar rules for implication, and two familiar rules for negation, namely excluded middle and deductive explosion. Let's pause to look briefly at the deductive explosion rule. It can be read as if gamma entails not p, then gamma p entails q. So here, gamma is an arbitrary sequence of formulas, intuitively a sequence of assumptions, and on the basis of those assumptions, we've asserted not p. And that means that if we further assume p, then we can assert any formula because we're in a vacuous case. The final rule on the slide is the exchange rule that allows us to interchange two formulas in the antecedent or intuitively exchange two assumptions. And uh, it characterizes classical logic relative to orthomodular logic because uh, we will see that our sequent calculus for orthomodular logic differs from this sequent calculus just in this last rule. Uh, intuitively, it expresses that in classical logic, the order of assumptions doesn't matter. Here is the sequent calculus for orthomodular logic. As you can see, it has almost all the same rules, except the exchange rule is a conditional exchange rule. It requires establishing or deriving two additional sequence that together demonstrate that essentially p and q are compatible relative to gamma. So as long as we derive that gamma pq entails p and gamma qp entails q, we can exchange two assumptions just as in the classical case. Now, you may ask at this point, first, what does this have to do with quantum logic? And second, what does this have to do with natural deduction? Because indeed, both were promised in the title of the talk. However, I haven't really said anything about either of them. So let me do that now. Quantum logic, uh, in quantum logic, propositions are formalized by closed subspaces of Hilbert space. And of course, closed subspaces form an orthomodular la uh, lattice, uh, which means that the sequent calculus that we saw a couple of slides ago is sound for quantum logic as well, essentially as a special case. So we have that if the sequent Q is derivable, then the proposition Q is true in every state of the quantum system. And very fortunately, this, uh, this physical soundness theorem, soundness result, uh, generalizes in quite a natural way to arbitrary sequence. So if we have a sequent P1 through Pn entail Q, and that's derivable, then we may not be sure that Q is true in every state of the system, but it will be true in every state that is obtained by first verifying P1 through Pn. What do I mean by this? I mean that we measure P1, we measure P2, and so forth to Pn, n measurements, and if we obtain a positive result for each of the n measurements, then we can be sure that Q is true. Uh, we can be sure specifically that the physical system is in a state where Q is true. So just as a quick example, let's look at the sequent spin Z is a half, spin Y is a half, entails spin Z is a half, and uh, this sequent is not derivable. Intuitively, the explanation for this is, well, logically, the order of assumptions matters in orthomodular logic. So uh, once we have assumed that spin y is a half, we can no longer be sure that spin z is a half. And uh, physically, we're talking about some electron, and we're talking about measurements. And the explanation is that when we go to measure the spin of the electron along the y-axis, and we find that it is positive, we've changed the state of the system, and we can no longer be sure that the spin along the z-axis is positive as well. For natural deduction, I really just want to make three points. First, uh, 
there isn't a formal definition of what natural deduction is that I could compare the sequent calculus to. However, to the extent that a consensus exists about what natural deduction is, uh, it appears to be that natural deduction is characterized by subproofs. What is a subproof? A subproof is a segment of a proof that begins with an assumption uh, from which we derive a conclusion, and then the entire segment is used to justify an assertion that does not depend on the assumption that was made. And uh, the second point is that a sequent calculus can be a natural deduction system. In particular, a sequent calculus that appeared in Gensen's 1936 paper on the consistency of arithmetic is now understood to be a natural deduction system. And uh, this is important for this discussion because uh, my, my understanding is that the sequent calculus that I have been discussing is a natural deduction in exactly the same way. The final point, though, is it is true that when people think of natural deduction, usually they think of something like Fitch notation. Fitch notation is used to teach natural deduction. So it's reassuring to know that there is a back and forth translation between the sequent calculus and a Fitch style system. Now, I won't give the rules of the Fitch style system explicitly, except to say that they can be obtained directly uh, in essentially a one-to-one -one way from the rules of the sequent calculus. Let's just look at one example to see how the translation works. On the left, we have a Fitch style derivation. Let me walk through it. We are proving that not not a entails, or sorry, implies a. So we assume not not a, and certainly we have not not a on that basis. We then further assume that A, and we have that A on that basis in the same way. Separately, we assume not A, and we also have A. The reason we can assert A here is because we've assumed not A, and not A, um, we, had, we had previously asserted the negation of this assumption, not A. And so we're in a vacuous case, and we can assert any proposition. And so by excluded middle, we have A under assumption not not A, and so we have that not not A implies A. I think this is fairly clearly a natural deduction, and now it just remains to see how it can be translated into um, a sequent calculus derivation. What we do is we uh, attach a sequent to every assertion, and we put that assertion on the right of the sequent, and on the left of the sequent, we put the sequence of all of the assumptions that we have made on whose basis we're making the assertion. So for example, in line six, we have the sequent not not a comma not a entails a. And the reason for this is because we've assumed first not not a, then not a, and now we're asserting a on that basis. So we have a back and forth translation between these two notations. And I think one of the uh, philosophical ideas in mathematics is that if two objects differ just in their notation, then they're essentially the same object. And in particular, I think that the deduction on the left is fairly clearly a natural deduction. And therefore, the deduction on the right, which is equivalent to it, uh, must be a natural deduction too. However, if you feel that notation really is a core part of what makes natural deduction natural deduction, then I hope that your takeaway from this talk is that there was a natural deduction system, but for some reason it appeared just at the end. Thanks very much for your attention, 